before 1973, you had uh, King Mohammed Zayed Shah, and he had been the king uh, from 1933 up until yeah, 1973. So Afghanistan had uh, technically got its independence from Britain in uh, 1919. And so, you know, the country was relatively uh, uh, young at that point. Uh, but what he decided to do upon becoming king is he wanted to uh, basically uh, modernize uh, Afghanistan and to make it a part of the international community, right? So the United States recognized Afghanistan in uh, 1934. And this is also the same year that uh, Afghanistan joined the League of Nations. You know, so he really tried to kind of uh, expand uh, uh, Afghanistan like, and put it on like the world stage. It didn't help that during World War II, he tended to align more with the Axis powers, but that's kind of complicated and you see a similar thing across many places in the Middle East. It's long to explain, but anyway. So after the war, uh, you did happen to have a lot of uh, uh, tribal tensions within Afghanistan. And this is something that we'll kind of talk about a little bit later in the video, because what you have to understand is that Afghanistan has many different ethnicities, many different tribes. And so what he decided to do is basically to modernize Afghanistan uh, and by putting lots of different uh, uh, economic reforms in. And in order to do this, he ended up getting uh, uh, some foreign uh, assistance, right? Some foreign advisors. Now, the point with this is that Afghanistan at this point happened to be on the border with the Soviet Union. And they end up getting a lot of advisors from the Soviet Union, right? Because as we discussed in our video about uh, Tito, uh, so definitely check that video out, there was something known as the non-aligned movement, right? So during the Cold War, you had some countries which were like, right, we want to stay out of this Cold War. We don't want to be in the Western Bloc and we don't want to be in the Eastern Bloc. We just want to chill and we just want to trade with both sides, right? However, Afghanistan end up getting a lot of uh, foreign advice uh, from the Soviets, in particular within their intelligentsia and also within their officer class, right? So pay attention to that because that later on will play a factor, right? Now, the king was actually quite a liberal force in Afghanistan. So, for instance, throughout his entire uh, uh, you know, 40-year uh, reign, he never once uh, warranted uh, uh, an execution. And also, uh, he greatly encouraged there to be a reduction in the, the use of the death penalty for Afghanistan during this time. And in 1964, he ended up uh, pushing through a new constitution, yeah, which gave a parliament, it gave universal suffrage, uh, and it gave uh, women's rights. So, this is like, quite like revolutionary and stuff, yeah, this is quite a radical uh, proposal to have in a country like Afghanistan. However, with this, something to kind of note is three different things, right? First of all, he didn't really go like the full hog when it came to having a constitutional uh, uh, monarch. So for instance, he still retained far more power than someone like Queen Elizabeth would have, right? So, you know, he didn't really give up as much power as he ought to have. Second of all, by giving uh, women's rights in Afghanistan, which is a society that's very tribal, even today, you know, 74% of Afghanistan is rural today. Back in 1964, it was 90%, right? So even more rural uh, back then than it is today. So this ended up annoying many of the Islamists uh, within Afghanistan who are very traditional. And the third thing that he did was in this constitution, he banned members of the royal family from having any place in government, which makes sense. You know, we can see what he was trying to do. However, this had some unintended uh, consequences. Now, one of the major unintended consequences of these reforms was that a certain Mohammed uh, Daoud Khan, who was the cousin of the king, he had been the prime minister from 1953 to 1963, and he had put in a lot of reforms to Afghanistan to help modernize it. However, this new constitution, because it barred other members of the royal family from having any part in government, it meant that there was no path for him to ever have any control over uh, any member of the royal family, right? So you can understand why the king decided to do this, because obviously if you've got a, a modern uh, country and stuff, you don't really want like uh, members of the royal family and like the aristocracy and et cetera, et cetera, to be playing a part in the government, yeah? However, to go out of your way to purposely exclude people from, from the government, you know, because if he was the prime minister from 53 to 63, there probably was quite a lot of people who might have supported him, although obviously he was appointed by the king, so, you know, but still there might have been some people who would have been in favour of him, right? So you shouldn't go out your way to ban people from being able to hold office, right? If the people of Afghanistan want him, then they can elect him, right? So going out your way to do this is going to alienate people in your family, right? And this is exactly what ended up happening. So Daoud Khan end up aligning himself with some communists and also bear this in mind as well. We keep kind of, you know, just bear this in mind. So he aligned himself with the communists, right? And in 1973, 
he ended up uh, launching a coup which overthrew the king. So he didn't end up killing the king. There's something to kind of note, right? This is a little side tangent. So Muhammad Zaya Shah, he actually lived up until 2007. So actually when the Taliban were overthrown in 2001, he ended up returning to Afghanistan and lived out the rest of his life there as I believe he was called like the father of the nation or, or he was given some fancy term like that. So arguably he could have been the king from 1933 to 2007, which would as far as I'm aware, make him one of the, the longest reigning monarchs of all time, right? Maybe even the number one. So as long as this coup and subsequent things didn't end up happening, there's nothing to say that Afghanistan and all that time couldn't have been led by this one uh, king. So Daud Khan, he ended up uh, overthrowing the king and he put in place a republic, right? And as time went on, he became more dictatorial and, you know, he ended up uh, having setting up like a one-party state. And this greatly annoyed many of the communists, right? Because he ended up then purging the communists and like kicking them out and stuff, right? So the problem with this is that obviously Moscow has just, you know, is, is annoyed at this guy. And many of the intelligentsia and many of the, uh, the officer class, they are, are pro-Moscow. So what do you think is going to happen? And bear in mind as well, this guy was putting even more like liberal reforms, even more things for like uh, women's rights, etc, etc. So he's annoying both the, the quote-unquote left and the quote-unquote right yeah, within this situation. And it's also something to note that Muhammad Dawood Khan, he was very much a pro-Pashtun, right? So, you know, the Pashtuns, because they've never officially, as far as I'm aware, had a census, which has included uh, ethnic groups, because of, you know, obviously the political tensions from that, uh, we don't have exact numbers for how many Afghans are of what ethnicity, but roughly between 38% and 50% of Afghans are Pashtun, right? You know, so they're not the majority, but they're the uh, they're plurality, right? They're the largest, like, kind of group. And he was very much pro-Pashtun, and he was in favour of uniting all of Pashtunistan. However, Pashtunistan, because of the Durand line which the British drew dividing uh, up what at them, that point was British India from uh, Afghanistan, this meant that some of Pashtunistan is in Afghanistan and some of it is within Pakistan. So the Pakistanis end up becoming very annoyed by this because they're like, right, you want to carve off some of our country? We're going to close the border and cut the trade with you. So this has led the, the Afghans to become even more reliant on the Soviets for uh, aid. So in 1978, there ends up being the Saar Revolution, right? Uh, and this is when basically uh, the communists end up doing a coup and they end up overthrowing uh, uh, Daoud Khan and they install a communist regime in Afghanistan. Now, as we've said before, Afghanistan is overwhelmingly uh, you know, rural and what happens in Kabul, you know, Kabul is not Afghanistan, right? It doesn't represent Afghanistan in, in its strict sense. So all these intellectuals within the city, you know, they don't really speak for, for the rest of the, of the country, right? Um, and especially Afghanistan being a very uh, Islamic country, people there are not very happy with this kind of like atheistic, um, like very uh, radical, like secular kind of ideology, right? And on top of that, the communists weren't exactly very organised, you know, there was lots of infighting. So I believe that, like, their leader, uh, Armin, he ended up kind of, like, taking control and he was very ruthless and ended up cracking down on lots of people. And the Soviets were getting very worried, yeah, because this is right on their border and they're like, right, if communism fails here, this is going to make communism in general look very bad, right? And so what they decided to do is decided to send in troops to help prop up this government. However, at the same time as they invaded, Almin end up being uh, overthrown and he end up like being killed. And, you know, as far as we're aware, the Soviets had no part in it because while they didn't like him, he was the only justification that they would have had to have gone in, right? Because otherwise it would have just looked like a straight out invasion, which is essentially what it was. So this ended up happening and, you know, the Soviets uh, invaded. They put in like their kind of like puppet guy to kind of like run things. But... At the same time, this being the Cold War, you had America, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and many other Islamic countries funding the Mujahideen, right? So the Mujahideen, these are basically uh, Islamic uh, 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 fighters and stuff. And within all of this mess, you know, they end up like obviously 
uh, inflicting lots of casualties on the Soviets and eventually end up uh, contributing to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, 34,000 uh, uh, Soviets end up being killed in that. You definitely check out the film Ninth Company. Uh, we're going to do that in the future when we uh, cover uh, film reviews. Uh, it's, in terms of foreign films, it's definitely one of the best, so definitely check that out. And it covers the Soviet experience within Afghanistan. But obviously, a lot of Afghans end up being killed in this war, like it's something like over a million, and many of them were displaced as well. So everything that kind of came later is as a result of this coup back in 1973. So we're going to kind of think about what might have happened differently, which would have basically stopped this future like instability and like chaos from happening, right? 